Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, next episode of Governance uh, Dialogues. It's a pleasure to have our viewers back to this channel. Um, and those of you who are new to the program, please feel free to subscribe to this channel, but also to our newsletter, which is disseminated um, based on, on our um, website, uh, govern.center. And in this new series, which we're recording and releasing over the months of the fall, we're focusing on an important uh, topic and one that has been gaining prominence in, in recent months and indeed years in the global corporate governance agenda, but also in the world of policymakers and corporate leaders and investors, and that is um, climate change. And this episode specifically um, builds on previous episodes that we've done in, in uh, focusing on uh, issues and the campaign uh, at ExxonMobil, uh, focusing on um, uh, issues and we've been discussing related to disclosure of uh, climate emissions and in various uh, episodes that we've recorded uh, previously. And in this dialogue, I've invited um, a world, world leader on, on this topic to join us, uh, David Pitt Watson, who will be talking to us about how to finance, account and disclose uh, climate uh, commitments. And I think when we first connected um, a couple of uh, months back to start discussing this uh, this episode, uh, of course, the topic was uh, was urgent, but perhaps in the context of developments we've seen over the summer in Europe, uh, in Siberia, uh, uh, Italy, uh, also Greece uh, and Turkey, the fires that we've seen uh, all over Europe, perhaps there's been an extra, um, I would say, degree of urgency that has been added to this conversation around climate disclosure. And indeed, I think that uh, two reports uh, frame our conversation for today quite um, nicely. And, and that is a recent report by the International Panel on Climate Change, which uh, summarizes uh, research by about 240 authors and that has reviewed, has reviewed uh, 14,000 uh, documents and, and reports and has concluded that each of the past four decades has become uh, subsequently warmer than the previous one, that the CO2 emissions are the highest uh, uh, that they ever been in the last uh, two million years and that these uh, events have translated to tangible losses. And we've seen for example, insurance losses from natural disasters reaching about $40 billion in the first half of this year, which is the second highest amount that they've ever uh, reached. Um, and another report by the International um, Energy Agency, uh, which warns that um, in order to reach the uh, targets that have been set by the Paris uh, Climate Accord, um, about only half of the technologies are um, have been commercialized. So we have quite a long way to go. And while investors, regulators, and um, uh, observers, citizens um, uh, are focusing on this topic, there's clearly um, um, a long way to go. And so what I would like to do in this, in this episode um, in conversation with, uh, with David is to perhaps uh, shed further light as to what companies and regulators are doing in this area and what remains to be done. So, uh, David, with that, that being said, I would like to uh, welcome you to the program and uh, thank you for joining us today. And thank you. And so let me perhaps before I, I jump uh, to our uh, first question, say a few words about your background. You've been involved in, uh, you've worn various hats. Um, you know, academic hats uh, as your fellow at the Cambridge uh, Business School, uh, uh, also uh, political advisory hats. You've been involved in, in advising policymakers, including uh, Tony Blair, Gordon Bla Brown, and others, but also, and perhaps for the purposes of our conversation today, you've also uh, set up uh, or been working with investors and notably, uh, of course, uh, Hermes uh, Equity Ownership uh, Services. Um, where, where, which you've in fact launched, um, and you've you've co-written uh, two two important books that I'll be highlighting in the conversation today. But I'll I'll come back to that in in in, in perhaps a minute. Um, and you've been involved with the UN uh, environmental uh, uh, finance um, environmental program finance initiative. So quite a bit uh, of sort of different roles, diverse background, and and a lot of these roles have obviously touched on the issue that uh, we are looking to address here today. So perhaps for the first question that I would like to, to pose to you um, is specifically around uh, commitments by companies. So climate commitments to net zero by 2050. 
Um, and I would like to, to ask you what you make of these. How realistic are they um, in the today's environment? And in fact, are they enough? So, yeah, lots of commitments, Alicia, from companies and from financiers as well, saying that they're committed to net zero. And look, we, we have to have those commitments. We need to get to net zero because we're in 2022 and you're already complaining about you know, the heat in Italy or the fires in California, that's the thin end of the wedge unless we can get to net zero by 2050. I think the question of whether they're enough is whether we can absolutely see that in 2021 and 2022, these commercial organizations are doing what they need to do in order to make sure that we're on the trajectory whether or not governments are doing what it is that governments need to do. And on that, I would say the jury's out, but I'm nervous. And I'm nervous because the 2020s are the decisive decade on this. If we don't take the right steps to resolve this in the 2020s, in the 2030s, it's going to be enormously expensive to get our climate back. Indeed, there's even questions about whether that would be possible if we leave it to the 2030s. So all these announcements I'm very, very pleased about, um, but, but can I honestly put my hand on my heart and say, when I read those announcements by companies or by financial organizations, I can see that they are being delivered today in terms of what needs to be done in 2021. We've still got a gap there. Okay, and, and um, it's interesting, I mean, it is in fact uh, something we've been discussing in, in the context of specific dialogues. For example, I had Aisha Mastani from, uh, from uh, Calstras who spoke about um, uh, the Exxon campaign that has, has as you know, uh, achieved important results in terms of replacing the board. There have been also important developments at uh, uh, Chevron um, and, and, and Shell uh, recently, and an enormous focus on, on um, uh, sort of natural resource companies operating in the natural resource sector. And in fact, I think the, the IA report, if I'm not mistaken, you know, squares focusly on, on, on those companies and, and arguing that they have a kind of a um, a brunt or an important role to play in, in kind of uh, looking at uh, CO2 emissions. But I would like to ask you what your thoughts as to, as to the other players. So, you know, if we look at the Amazons of this world, the companies that are actually growing uh, significantly in the current environment post COVID and are poised to grow um, in the coming years, what do you think is, is sort of uh, their role? Um, and if you look at the global economy, is it fair to, to just focus on the, on, the, on the natural resource companies or should indeed the policymakers and the, the corporate or the investor focus be a more broadly spread and looking at companies that are that are growing um, and in, in, in the current sort of economic conjecture. Yeah. And so, so this affects everyone would be my bottom line. Having said that though, Alicia, it's not daft to start with the natural resource companies like uh, an Exxon or with the transport companies or with an engine manufacturer. And indeed, you'll see the one of the most uh, interesting investor initiatives, the Climate Action 100 Plus, has indeed taken the 160 companies that are most exposed and most contributing to climate change as the ones where they'll focus. Now, I, I guess Amazon is not amongst those, but I would expect that Amazon, as a company of such scale and influence, if it doesn't have a climate plan, that is one that demonstrates that what it's doing is consistent with sustainability until 2050, then we've got, it's got a real problem and we've got a real problem. And, and so, so to, to continue with the, with the Amazon example, you know the, the employees of Amazon have tabled some resolutions that, are, um, that, that have also addressed inter alia climate change issues, employees, stakeholder rights and others, and th those have been defeated um, uh, due to the fact that uh, their Amazon has a has a uh, an ownership structure which uh, is controlled uh, via multiple voting shares by by the founders, so just Jeff Bezos, and so the, all of these resolutions have actually been uh, defeated. So is, is there um, kind of a further 
or, or general governance context that facilitates in, in some cases or perhaps impedes in other cases um, this movement for, for stakeholders to actually vo vo voice sorry, their concerns in, a, in, a, in, a, in an effective way. And could you give some, some examples or perhaps thoughts on, on that? So, so, so yes, yeah, so, so look, I, I think the first thing I'd say is that the resolution of climate change there isn't a silver bullet. If there was a silver bullet, it needs to be done by nations and states, and they need to agree in Glasgow, um, town I was brought up in, yes. um, a, at the conference in November, the weather will be pretty miserable in November in Glasgow, and um, they need to agree something there. But look, they haven't been able to make a good agreement to make this work since Kyoto. Um, which is what 25 years ago uh, 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 now. And therefore, this has become a problem for everyone. It's become a problem for the way that individuals live, but it's certainly become a problem for um, uh, investors and how it is that they invest responsibly. And it's become an issue for boards of directors and how it is that they run companies. One of the things you're talking about is the interaction between them. You know, you put in a motion to the annual general meeting and then does that change company behavior? Well, it might. It might even if you don't win. I mean, I think if I was to um, think about the glass being half full, I would say it is simply extraordinary. A, in a shareholder vote, a, most of which managers win with a 99% a, a, a majority, as you know, yeah. In a shareholder vote, a company that used to be the largest in the world by capitalization, like Exxon, could discover that by popular demand, its board was removed. I mean, simply symbolically, that is astonishing. Um, but is that the only way in which Amazon is going to be uh, encouraged to change? No, it will be encouraged to change by the workers voicing their uh, uh, views by the shareholders, even without a voice. Uh, a, a, a expressing uh, uh, their views by society, by governments expressing its views, passing laws and doing all of those sorts of things. Um, hopefully um, it's done because Jeff Bezos does realize that this is just simply not okay to run a company of that scale with such utter disregard for the uh, future of humanity. I mean, this is a really, really big deal now. This is a really, this makes COVID look like a small issue um, mm. if we fail to resolve climate change. But but we need to do all of that, Alicia. And and I think if, if a, someone was saying to me, oh, that won't work or that won't work, I would say, yeah, but if we all get all of these things to try and work, that's our best shot at this. Uh, uh, at this. And, 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 and be thoughtful about how and where it is that you want to exercise influence. There isn't just one way of doing it. Uh, right. And, and so you're mentioning, I think, what's interesting also um, action at the level of policymakers. And, you, you know, yep. you alluded that it, in your view that perhaps that's the most uh, important and or perhaps the most uh, impactful component and in, in, in the view of, of Glasgow. And, and I wonder what your thoughts are as to this kind of um, let's say, influenced by policymakers of um, various standard setting bodies. So if we take the example of the United States, of course, uh, under the Trump administration, SEC wasn't really, the Security and Exchange Commission, uh, wasn't really all that uh, vocal about ESG uh, issues, in particular on climate change disclosure. It is uh, uh, being much uh, more so with the last, uh, well, the, with this last spring consultation on on um, ESG disclosure standards, and I wonder if you think that that sort of example or that channel uh, of policy influence through securities regulators influencing disclosure standards, influencing also perhaps international, well, or the position of country A or B in international uh, discussion on on accounting standards. Is that something that you see as a really impactful way or impactful kind of mechanism for, for change? I, I mean, yes, I think it can be. Um, and, and, and of course the SEC has got its own independence about what it does, but the, the mood that has been created by the new uh, a, a regime in the US has made the thought of being able to resolve some of these issues that are issues that relate to the financial 
uh, services industry has made that possible for the first time. Um, and it, it makes the direction of travel clear. I mean, again, I think what I'd say, Alicia, is we need to be doing this together. Um, we don't have a clear direction that has been given us by policymakers that says, look, here's the here's America's budget and here's Britain's budget and here's China's budget for carbon dioxide for the next 30 years and we will enforce this so that we get ourselves down to net zero. So we need to be doing all sorts of other things where you're asking banks and you're asking fund managers to commit to net zero, where you're asking all companies to commit to net zero and where we all go on that path together to, to 2050. But does it make a difference that the regulator is clear about the direction of travel, absolutely massively it does. Is the regulator strictly necessary for much of that travel? I'd say often not. And often they, yeah, the private sector likes to hide behind the regulator as the reason for not doing things. And we can't do that. We don't have time. Mm. And speaking of one, one sort of area where regulators have been uh... Kind of vocal, I would say, and, and, and insistent in the UK, particularly with the review uh, of the accounting profession, but but also in other countries around uh, some some issues uh, of independence of, of auditors and, and conflicts of interest, and something that's been highlighted in, in various uh, uh, in various corporate corporate and corporate governance uh, scandals. Um, I know that you you're uh, quite familiar, not to say intimately familiar with the with the accounting industry, as you've been an uh, an independent director on, on I think KPMG's um, uh, board, and and I would like to ask you what is your view of the role of the of the accounting profession in providing ensure assurance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, climate uh, disclosures? Is there perhaps a role uh, for the uh, auditing and the profession or for the auditors mm. to, to have perhaps a, a greater role in providing assurance to investors on, on these issues? Or do you see that as being perhaps a, um, um, an issue that's a little bit too far away from what has traditionally been a, kind of a financial assurance uh, focused audit? So I think it's absolutely profound, Alicia. I'm I think it's profound in, in two ways. The one that is getting the most press right now is, is the notion of could we set up sustainability standard reporting for the globe? And um, that's a very good idea, which I'd support. But I think there's a, on climate, there's a bigger thing that we need to do and do absolutely now. And that is that we need to resolve the most extraordinary anomaly, which is that Right now, when companies are drawing up their accounts, they're uniquely turning a blind eye to climate pressures. So there are um, oil companies who will be valuing their oil wells as though oil was being pumped out of the ground in them in 2040 and 2050, receiving 80, $100 a barrel. Well, that is completely inconsistent with uh, any scenario for a sustainable world. Now we employ auditors who are supposed to look at those accounts and say, look, are these reasonable, true and fair presentations of the valuation? And so far, the auditors have not done what it is that they need to do, which is to say, well, look, wait a minute here. This, this doesn't look like something that can possibly take place unless we're assuming that the Earth's climate goes to hell in a handbasket. And if it does go to hell in a handbasket, then the whole commercial structure that we are, uh, 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 that drives our economy right now is under threat as well. So this assumption needs to be challenged. Now, they've not done that. Um, I uh, am optimistic that they will be doing that in the future, but it is a massive gap and a massive anomaly because essentially what's happening, Alicia, is that people are declaring profits on the basis of valuing assets as though there was no climate problem. Really? There is a climate problem. We all absolutely know that and assets need to be valued in that way and profits declared only after you recognize that and I hope decided that you're going to trade sustainably. By the way, if you did do that, that would make such a huge difference to the incentives in the commercial system uh, that, that it would be it would be a, 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 a really profound and important change. And indeed, that's why I've spent the last couple of years putting really quite a lot of work into, into seeing how we get 
those reforms. Okay, and and speaking sort of, um, you know, you you mentioned you referred to to valuation of assets, and and I, I'm wondering if you could say perhaps a few words about um, recent accounting standard changes and those that would, in your view, you know, further to your earlier point, would be required. Um, with re referred to stranded assets and, and remaining loopholes that need to be closed in order to actually, as you say, value these assets at, 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 at fair value. Um, and how would they, would that actually, if, if these changes were, were actually put in place, how would that change the prospects of the, of the, of the listed uh, natural resource companies? So for example, you know, I'm thinking of uh, Aramco that went uh, public just, uh, what is it, two years ago, uh, and that has, has been um, quite profitable since its listing. Um, other companies that, that were, you know, we, we talked about Exxon that, that has not perhaps lived up to the, to the expectations of, of shareholders, but is not a, necessarily a, a money losing company either. What are your thoughts as to, as to, as to the changes in accounting standards and their implementation and what would they do to the, to the let's say the national, to the NOx and also to the, to the large uh, privately owned uh, oil giants? Yeah, so, so look, there, there haven't been any fundamental changes to accounting standards, but there has been new guidance that is absolutely definitive that has been written in the past um, 18 months, two years. Um, so, so look, how has it possibly been the case that we can be valuing all wells the way that I described? The reason is a bit like the frog boiling. 30 years ago, you didn't need to worry about this. And then 29 years ago, maybe you didn't need to in 28 and 20. People have followed what they did the year before. Yeah. Um, and so with a group of investors and, and with some of the uh, uh, investor groups like the Principles for Responsible Investment and UNFFI, we approached the standard setters and said, please, can you give guidance that says if you're going to use international financial reporting standards, which are used everywhere except the United States pretty well, um, this needs to be taken into account. And we also went to the auditors, the Audit and Assurance Standards Board, said, could you put out a similar sort of paper? They also put out a similar sort of paper. So that all occurred within the last sort of one or, 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 or two years. And on top of that, all the big investor groups, I mean, all the big investor groups with over a hundred trillion dollars said, we want to see you implement what the uh, uh, accounting standard setters are saying, which is climate's taken into account and the big assumptions, the material assumptions are shown. And by the way, we want all those material assumptions to be sustainable material assumptions consistent okay. with the Paris Agreement. So in terms of the support that we've got, it's certainly outside the United States, it's pretty clear what it is that now needs to be done. Now, I have to say, if you review the 2020 accounts coming out around the world, we have got a long way to go before that uh, is in place. But if the standards are followed, and if the uh, views of the investors are respected, then you would have a situation where if you were looking at making an investment and thinking about whether it was profitable and you could put it on the balance sheet of the company, you would need to value it as though the future was a sustainable future. That makes a massive difference because it essentially says that stranded asset is stranded. It's not valuable. You've got to write it down. That then changes the behavior of companies. It means that uh, the incentives that are there for the company are consistent with the, in the incentives for the investor, which is to make a long-term real return, not one that uh, 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 requires the destruction of the, of the climate to get there. So it's quite nerdy, all this accounting stuff, but it can be really, really significant if you get it right. Yes, of course, and and, it, and of course, the natural question that jumps to to mind, and, and you you were referring already, and sort of, <laughs> you know, um, uh, commented before I had a chance to uh, to ask the question is around the assumptions that you're seeing in the annual reports of of, of these uh, of these companies, and to what extent do you see kind of specific changes that are already perhaps being uh, taking place in 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 specific respects, uh, and and where there is perhaps uh, a large way to go. And, and that's sort of the first part of the question. And I think the second is, of course, you know, what is the role uh, of corporate governance and the, the role of the board um, where we've seen, for example, and we talked about Exxon 
where the boards are being renewed with this new mindset, do you see also kind of a shift in, 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 in the quality of disclosure um, and, and kind of more bold moves towards uh, recognizing some of these stranded assets as such? Yeah, well, uh, l let's start with some of the bad news because we're, we're just, we'll publish next month, uh, Alicia, a report that looks at over 100 climate challenged companies and asks, do their annual report and accounts show that they are using assumptions that are consistent with sustainability? This is from 100 over 100 climate challenged companies we couldn't find a single one that was. Now, if we go back to your first question about these net zero declarations, which I was saying I was hugely in support of, mm -hmm. we need to see that there's evidence that that's what's happening in the way that you manage the company. And the best evidence would be in the way that you calculate your profits and your solvency, which is in the annual account report and accounts, that we're not seeing yet. That is something that the board needs to think about. They need to think about it, first of all, because they have a general obligation to make sure that their company is being run appropriately for the shareholders, who, by the way, are absolutely crystal clear that they do not want money that is being made in a way that is stealing from the climate in order to pay dividends. Absolutely crystal clear in the petitions that they've written. So need to be run it for the shareholders and for other stakeholders. And clearly other stakeholders uh, uh, want a sustainable climate as well. And you'll discover as well in many jurisdictions that boards of directors have got particular responsibilities about the uh, annual report and accounts that they're issuing. Yeah, that's why we have them audited and all the rest of it. And look, if what you're doing is using a set of assumptions that are clearly unsustainable assumptions, that you haven't even taken climate into account, or if you have, you're not saying what your assumptions are, even if they're unsustainable ones, you're hiding that from your shareholders, boy, are you remiss in terms of what your director's duties ought to be. So this is something where the boards of directors need to think about climate overall. But if I was sitting on a board of directors right now, I think the first thing that I would say would be when we issue our annual report and accounts, are we clear about the assumptions that we are making and whether they are consistent with those statements we made six months ago about us being net zero? And if they're not, we need to change those assumptions. But, but further to that, actually, sort of two questions, of course, jump to mind. One specifically on, on boards, and, and we, we've spoken about governance indirectly. Um, but, but if we look at boards kind of and, and think about boards uh, more directly in this, in this conversation, um, there, there have been in the corporate governance uh, debate, as you know, kind of a focus on increasing uh, financial literacy on audit committees that have been focused on more recently on, for example, cybersecurity uh, or ability of companies to deal with cybersecurity concerns and, and whether the boards have those kind of risks, uh, those kind of uh, that kind of expertise reflected on the board. And generally speaking, the answer has been in large, in large, by and large, no. Um, mm -hmm. But has been, I, I think, at least to my view, kind of not very much discourse around kind of um, environmental um, sort of skill sets, let's say, represented on the board. Certainly, in the level of management, yes. Is that something that you see as, as a, being a, a concern or are we indeed no. expecting too much of boards in, 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 in terms of, you know, having these, these uh, very different and, and comprehensive co pockets of expertise that are where um, they're being uh, called to account? So I, I think, Alicia, there's even a bigger problem, which, which uh, I, the corporate community has got to ask for help on which is what constitutes a, a climate plan as part of a business plan that is one that is truly net zero and sustainable. And I don't think I know the answer to that question for every business. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a really good idea if a, our best thinkers and our regulators could think about what it is that that might look like. Um, and therefore that companies know when they've done the right thing and they're the right side of the line. And when they do the wrong thing and they're the wrong side of the line, 
clearly what is the wrong side of the line is making a bunch of assumptions about your profits that are dependent on the climate being destroyed. That simply must be the wrong side of the line. But there'll be other things as well. And so it's not just a question of the expertise on the board. It is what is it that we're asking corporates to do? And if I was on a corporate board, which I am right now, mm. um, I would be really quite concerned about that and will be asking, please, can you allow that to happen? I mean, not least because if you don't, a, I can imagine in 15 years time, you and if we don't solve the climate problem, you will be sued personally for damages just like the directors of asbestos companies in the 1960s were sued in the 1980s, yeah? We, we are heading for that sort of thing. That would make quite a lot of people listening to us nervous. <laughs> no, but but, this, is, but this, is a, this is a business issue. Look, I'm a business person. Businesses, businesses run in general by uh, uh, women and men of, 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 of goodwill who are not wanting to do things that are destroying the world for their children and their grandchildren. I absolutely guarantee you that. I've spent 40 years in business. But they do need some guidance. And they particularly need some guidance because the evidence is that in the most exposed companies right now, they are not currently running their financial model as one that is consistent with a sustainable planet. So we need some help in doing this. I think it is doable, but it needs all voices. It needs the, the citizens voice. It needs the investors voice. It needs the public sector voice, the policymakers voice. And it also needs business people to be listening to that voice and to be making sure that the transformation is taking place. But they would be hugely helped by something that said, if you do this and everybody else does this, then the corporate sector will indeed be one which is moving towards net zero, whatever it is that the rest of the world is doing. One of those things must be, when you draw up your accounts, the assumptions are sustainable ones. No, of course. Lots of others as well. And, and I think you're, you're highlighted and we've, we've spoken about sort of the various uh, parts of that equation, whether we're talking about uh, investors, regulators, boards and whatnot. And, and, and clearly uh, there is a policymakers a need for, for uh, joint uh, thinking and joint uh, action. But perhaps just to, to close this uh, fascinating conversation with you today, I'd just like to perhaps one ask one slightly controversial question around um, this topic. You know, we, we do know that in, in at least when we look at listed markets, there has been uh, an increase in concern for policymakers and, you know, ongoing discussion within OECD circles that it used to be, you know, uh, privy to when I was part of the organization, but it's still, of course, ongoing uh, around short termism. And this idea that, you know, investors are looking at long term um, targets and are th that their objectives are aligned uh, with long term value creation, which is uh, therefore aligned to lower CO2 emissions. It basically is linked on the assumption that investors are fundamentally long-term investors and their, their objectives are aligned with that long-term vision. Is there perhaps a gap in that, in that thinking um, as it stands today? Well, look, in, in most people are paid an investment to, to use the term to generate alpha, which is to outperform everybody else. And doing that is done by trading shares, which is a pretty short term activity. Mm. You spend less time thinking about how do we get good companies. But the thing that pays people's pensions and makes sure that they've got savings is that the underlying companies are sound and that they're contributing to an economy that is sound. So I think you always have this problem um, a, a, that when people listen to the portfolio manager, they're hearing somebody trying to make a trading decision. And that's not the best way to run a company on behalf of the investors who have given the money to the portfolio manager. Mm -hmm. um, you have to run it the right way, which means running the right way financially to make a profit in the long term, but also not to do that in a way that is going to destroy the very planet on which the people who gave the money to the portfolio manager are going to have to live. No, I, I certainly agree with your views. And actually, uh, for those of you who are watching us, you might want to to consult uh, some of the the interviews, but also the books that uh, interviews that we we've hosted, and we've hosted uh, an interview with one of your co-authors 
of uh, What They Do With Your Money, which is a book you've written with, uh, with Stephen Davis and, and John Lukomnik. And Stephen will be featured uh, in uh, forthcoming episodes of, of this program. And with John, we've had a conversation just uh, a few months ago around his um, a recent book about uh, about beta um, activism. So certainly, I think we're we're sort of building uh, different um, parts uh, of what I think is a very important and, and interesting debate. So I would like to to thank you, David, for joining us, and hopefully, uh, looking forward to uh, somewhat more uh, optimistic uh, results coming out of the of the next uh, co-op meeting. Yeah, and and, and I, I think as well, Alicia, um, it a you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Scot, so that Scots are always supposed to be miserable. But, but actually, if you were to look at what it is that we've achieved in the last 20 years in terms of responsible investment, it's quite extraordinary. I, I, I remember going to the Paris COP and we'd organised with investor groups a petition of investors. And it was the first sort of mega petition of sort of 20, 30 trillion uh, dollars. And it was saying, please do a really strong deal because that will have the least economic cost to us if you do that. So tax carbon and, you know, limit it and trade and do all of those sorts of things. And I remember I'd been involved in some of the negotiations running up to the COP and one of the negotiators coming to me and said, when I first saw you and I heard you were an investor, I thought, oh no, that's a terrible headache. They'll try and undermine things. That's not the case today. The investors are absolutely clear that we need to have a sustainable planet because if we don't have a sustainable planet, we aren't going to have many investments that are worth very much. And we're certainly not doing very much good for the citizens whose money that we're supposed to be investing. So the long-term trend on this is very, very positive in the investment community, but we okay. don't have too much longer to be able to solve this climate issue. We need to get down to it now. Well, that's certainly some, uh, I mean, I, I certainly agree with you and uh, hopefully our, our listeners will also be interested in, in, uh, in um, I'm sure they will be interested in, in the thoughts you've shared today. So thank you so much for, for your time. And uh, for those of you who are have tuned in uh, for this episode of Governance Dialogues, we uh, encourage you to continue joining us for future programs um, where we'll be uh, exploring uh, further in further detail issues relating to uh, climate change, governance, uh, disclosure, and all of those topics that are important, uh, especially in this time as we're looking at uh, developments in, in Europe, but also uh, all over the world with uh, climate change. So thanks for joining us and look forward to having you on uh, future episodes. Thank you, Alicia.